my roommate is the most vegan vegan that you'll ever meet. She saw a video online recently that our blackberries have worms in them. Is that true? Let's check it out. Here in western Washington, we have two main species of blackberry, one of which is invasive. If you've ever done any yard work out here, you'll know that both of them are just as pokey. Trailing blackberry, Rubus ursinus, is the only kind of blackberry left that is native to the Pacific Northwest. It grows in delicate canes that hug the ground. Its berries and thorns are smaller than those of its counterpart, but many people consider them more flavorful. Bears do too, considering the Latin ursinus suffix in its name. The Himalayan blackberry is what we tend to think of when we think of blackberries out in the woods. Rubus armeniasis is native to the region, grows aggressively, and outcompetes almost all native flora and can grow up to 15 feet, or 4.5 meters a year. When we consider a six month growing season, that's two and a half feet per month. Crazy. The Himalayan blackberry is what we tend to think of when we think of blackberries out in the woods. Rubus armeniasis is invasive to the region, grows aggressively, and outcompetes almost all native flora and can grow up to 15 feet, or four and a half meters a year. When we consider a six month growing season, that's two and a half feet per month. Crazy. The Latin name comes from rubus, which means bramble or thicket. Armeniasis hints to where it's from. Despite the name Himalayan blackberry, it actually originates from Armenia or Iran, depending on which book you ask. In the 1800s, it was introduced in Europe for cultivation and was brought to the United States in 1885 for the same reason by the infamous botanist Luther Burbank. Today, due to its ability to spread via seeds, tasty berries, cane tip rooting, and other survival factors, it's taken our landscape by storm. Like Yo Mama, it covers over 1.7 million acres in western Washington alone. I haven't seen the original worm testing videos online for myself, and I don't intend to. But what we will do is a 1 to 10 dilution of vinegar and wait 30 minutes with the berries submerged in the solution. I repeated the same test with a pint of blackberries from the store, and to my surprise, there were no worms that came out whatsoever, living or dead. Here we are in the high-tech sterile lab. The roommates have been kicked out of the kitchen mid-dinner making for our science. There are two samples here, the uh, store-bought sample and the wild sample. After 30 minutes of soaking in our 1 to 10 dilution, the store-bought sample had no worms visible, which is quite a surprise for me. And the wild sample does have a few worms in it, so you know what that means, we get to sound the worm horn. <laughs> to abduct the worm from its berry house and we're going to throw it under the microscope. First we got to find them in here. Where'd you see it? <laughs> if you've got a guess as to who we found in the blackberry, you've got about three seconds to say it aloud, otherwise it doesn't count. That's right, our old friend Drosophila Suzuki, and no, that's not a new motorcycle. This specific species of fruit fly is interesting because they prefer to lay eggs in fresh fruit that is just beginning to ripen, not just overripe and decaying fruit, as is the norm. As you can imagine, this also makes it public enemy number one for anyone with an orchard. Looks like we've caught this guy red-handed. You can see some blackberry that he's just digested on the slide next to him. Later, he would try to eat it again. We can count 11 distinct segments on their body. Take a look near the anterior, or the head side of the creature. Here, you can see a spiracle just one segment back from their mouth. The spiracle is a small opening connecting to the tracheae throughout their body. Similar to most insect larvae, they also have many smaller spiracles covering the body. Rather than being processed in lungs, it delivers oxygen directly to their cells. You might be wondering, this larva was balls deep inside of a blackberry, then totally underwater. How are they still breathing? Great question. 
Thanks. The spiracles have valves covering their sides, preventing water from getting in. They also have fine hydrophobic hairs covering the exterior, called setae. These help keep water away during total submersion and serve as a sensory tool that can detect temperature, touch, and even chemical signals. If you look closely at the little fellow exploring, you can see a repetitive motion near the mouth. The larva is using their mandibles, which are kind of a set of small, dark hooks that they use to macerate fruit before gobbling it up. They're the darkest part of the creature's body and have gone through a hardening process called sclerotization. Unlike the adult fruit fly who uses a proboscis for sucking the liquids, the larva simply uses their mandibles and digestive enzymes to chow down. Using the light from the microscope, we can see straight through the body. We can see ganglia, which are clusters of nerves, the spiracles and tracheae of the respiratory system, as well as the midgut and hindgut, which are similar to our stomach and colon. Near the posterior, we can see the malpigian tubes. These filter waste from the hemolymph, which is an insect's equivalent of blood. Rather than veins and arteries, a simple dorsal tube acts as a heart to encourage circulation. Finally, the little creature has a set of hormonal glands that produce hormones like ectazone. These regulate growth and will trigger metamorphosis from larva to pupa. If you haven't yet gotten the hint, it seems that bugs and insects are everywhere in our food system. It's kind of an open secret, and everything's worked out pretty much okay so far. Did you know that the FDA has an acceptable level of insects in food? And it's not zero. For example, in a 100 gram chocolate bar, we are allowed 60 insect parts in it. And of all the crop losses worldwide, about a quarter of them are due to insects. And one more fact that you can hide away in your brain and think about later, roughly 50% of store-bought leafy greens have caterpillar larvae in them. To wrap up, Here's a quote from Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. There was never any such thing as a clean place to work in the stockyards. There were bugs and everything. If you didn't see them, you would smell them. Can you smell the bugs in your food? And one final question. If all our food, even non-meats like vegetables and berries, have worms and insects in them, is it ever possible to truly be a vegan? If you'll excuse me, I have to go talk to my roommate. Thanks for watching and stay hungry.